Well, hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. My name is Jason Levine, and thank you so much for joining me today on the Friday Masterclass, where we are continuing our Essentials, Mastering the Essentials series. Uh, and today is sort of part two of the Audio Essentials, where we're going to be diving a little bit deeper into sound design. Now, last week we did some sound to picture mixing, uh, specifically in Premiere Pro, and highlighted a little bit more than I wanted to actually of using the more traditional track mixer. And then towards the end, we cut to using the essential sound panel, which is really a very fast and efficient way to mix without necessarily needing to know everything that's going on in the background. You don't really need to be a mix person, a mix engineer to know what you're doing with essential sound. And that is by design. That's kind of the idea. Now, one thing that I didn't get to show you were that if you are going to use essential sound, you actually still have control over all the things that you're doing. So despite the fact that as I, we showcased, you know, things like, um, uh, what did, we didn't do noise reduction. What did we do? <laughs> Adding uh, compression, right? Dynamics uh, or clarity as it's referred to in Essential Sam. It's a single slider. But in fact, it is, it is applying sometimes in part with some of our own uh, machine learning technology, Adobe Sensei, uh, the dynamics processor. So a compressor to that audio. And you still have access to all the parameters of that compressor should you want to manually make changes. Similarly, if you are going to denoise, if you are going to, we did talk about sort of DS and, and de-reverbing, although we didn't do it on those clips last week, you still have access to those master effects and you can still make changes to those. I don't know why my headphones are slipping off today. So um, very, oh, and then I had a lot of questions towards the end and after, hey, you, you did all the mixing, could we sort of get a, a finished version, sort of like a before and an after? So because we were doing it live, uh, I didn't have it entirely finished. So I finished it after the stream and we're gonna start with that just highlight a couple things, and then we're going to move into Audition where we're going to sort of break down the elements of creating sound design for, um, for our project. And this is one that I've shown here on Adobe Live. For those of you tuning in from No Film School, this will be new to many of you and some of you on uh, LinkedIn and elsewhere. So again, you're going to kind of get a sort of broader look at using one or both of these applications for sound design. And we'll talk about you know, some of the similarities along the way. I also want to clarify a couple things in terms of signal flow with the mixer. I know a lot of people were saying, ah, oh, this is a bit advanced and it's a bit, uh, yeah. I mean, it's nerdy, you know? And audio is very important. <laughs> so that's that. In any case, we are coming to you live on Adobe Live, Behance, YouTube, Twitter, and LinkedIn. So thank you so much for joining again. A big shout out to all of our friends over at No Film School. And I can see we've got, uh, Aime Palucci from Argentina and Rabed Hamdi from Tunisia, Debbie Shaw from Atlanta, Georgia, Oluwafemi from Nigeria, Cecily Cruz from Kansas. Man, you would think I made all of these up. These are all different locales tuning in right now. This is amazing. Thank you, friends, for watching. This is awesome. So great to have you all here. Uh, young Kenny J today. Oh, and happy birthday to Young Kenny J. Very nice to see you. Yuki from Vancouver, Joshua from South Carolina. LinkedIn user from Toronto. <laughs> Hello from the six. Great to see you. Audra from Georgia. Sonia from Munich. Christina from North Carolina. Wow. Ivana from Poland. Kelly from Chicago. Henry from Nigeria. August. Wow. We got so many people. Liz from Puerto Rico. Fahed from, uh, I don't know where that is exactly. Great to see you, Fahed Alabrach. Uh, Marcel from Germany, Christian from Atlanta. And we've got Farnazi, Tim, Reverb Mike, Anthony Via, David Maynard. Theo Theo and Katrina Torrijos, how are you doing? So nice to see you all. Thank you so much for tuning in. It is lovely to be here with you today. So, all right, let's, uh, let's go ahead and get right into it. I'm gonna switch over to my screen here and um, we're gonna start by, again, sort of going back to the, um, the before and after of what we did with this Project Two Step. Bernardo from Argentina, Daniel from Portugal, great to see you. Maria Paz from Argentina too. A lot of people from Argentina today, lovely. Melinda from NC, North Carolina. Julie Bonsoir de France, great to see you. Beth from New York, Costa Rica, Raleigh, North Carolina. Melinda from North Carolina. <laughs> I'm not just naming names at, at, at states and countries, I promise, or cities. Um, all right, so here is where we started last week. And before we do anything, I just want to point out, so just keeping it honest for you, okay? Here is the original mix with nothing done to it, all right? And the only thing that I did well, and I, I, I did create this submix 
for all of the dialogue. That's what you're seeing here, diamix. All right. So we talked a little bit about creating those submixes. This is just grouping all of the all of the talking parts to one fader. But there's no there's nothing done to it, right? And I just want you to look at the mixer, pay close attention, not trying to, you know, I'm not saying avert your eyes or anything. I try to fool you. Look at all the fader positions. They are all identical except in the original, the um, this yellow music clip. You may remember this is a percussion clip by my uh, buddy and oft collaborator Fred Fung. It's very bright and super loud. So I attenuated that to around um, uh, minus 14 here. Okay, that's the only difference because in the final mix you'll see that it's at minus four. I actually brought the um, the volume level of it up. The reason for that is because we used essential sound to automatically duck the music against the dialogue, right? You remember that from, from last week. So again, just take a look at the mixer there. There's no change. Uh, of course, they're, they're in slightly different positions. There are no changes except for that one fader. You see, I'm swapping between the two sequences. So everything is at the same nominal starting point. And of course, all effects and everything have been removed from all of the clips inside the mix here. So let's take a listen to the original unmixed, unbalanced, just what we call sort of, you know, faders only. Let's take a quick listen. We all listen to the whole thing. It's a minute. We'll do about 30 seconds. Oh, but Dwayne, I, I, I don't even have any of the money. Amy just, she split and took it all. She... If I talked to Amy, she came to see me. You see, she's what they call professional, and you're what they call can't win for losing. she tell you she took it all? She took the whole damn score? What she did is she paid me what she owed me for her half. But I, don't, I didn't get any of the money. Why, why do I have to pay you if I don't get any of it? Oh, you got it, Will. You got it. You just lost it. You just lost it. Okay. So there's the original. Again, you can hear just, and, and case in point, right? The music is obviously too loud. Now, we could drop it down, but it's also very bright, and some of that's going to potentially cloud some of the dialogue, so we did some changes to that in the parametric EQ. Um, but beyond that, you could just hear that just the, the levels of the dialogue are kind of, they're not all together, they're not all there. In this particular scene right here, as he continues talking, we start to kind of lose what he says. Take a listen. And you're what they call can't win for losing. Oh no, it's over here. What she did is she paid me what she owed me for her half. <laughs> but I don't, I... And now you're going to pay me for what you owe me. You, you, you can't even hear that part there. And you can actually see visually that, you know, the dialogue is, it's quieter, you know, uh, based on how this was captured. By the way, there is a, a scene towards the end right here. If you avert your eyes, <laughs> no, pay attention right here. You can actually see the boom skipping about. Do you see the boom moving there? <laughs> so people, people think that holding a boom is easy. It is not easy. It is not easy. It is a crazy skill. You got to be super strong uh, and to do it right. And again, to get consistent dialogue, as we revealed here, there's some areas that are not consistent where you can actually hear him moving a bit closer. They weren't really following, you know, this mic here, which is kind of the standard. This is the Sennheiser uh, MKH416 super cardioid pattern. It's very, very focused. So if you're, you know, literally one inch or however many centimeters at three centimeters or so, off that axis, the amplitude and the sound is different. So it's it's a skill. It's it's hard. And I love I've never all these times that I've shown this footage, I've never seen that. Okay, so that's the original. Here's the final. Now, again, we did some changes to that music bed to kind of take the edge off of the brightness. First, without because we already have the ducking implemented here, I'm going to disable the EQ. So if we wanted to keep it the same with all the brightness, it still is better on the ears because of how we used compression and ducking to make those voices more clear. But then we'll, I'll put the EQ back on so you can kind of hear what I would have done as my my actual final mix. So again, just real quickly for reference, here's the original. Oh, but Dwayne, I, I, I don't even have any of the money. Amy just... And here's the final. Oh, but Dwayne, I, I, I don't even have any of the money. Amy just, she split and took it all. She... If I talked to Amy, she came to see me. You see, she's what they call professional, and you're what they call can't win for losing. Okay, 
Now, the final was, let's take that off, to take that high end edge off, because by taking away all that, it's gonna just, it's gonna make it even creepier and a little bit more ominous. By the way, one other thing I wanna point out here. Now, when I did the ducking last time around, I was using essentially all of the default settings because we were running out of time. I think the default duck amount is 16 dB, which is which is too much. So that when you recover, right, when it when it comes back up again, the fade comes back in, it's very dramatic. Now, obviously, for a scene like this, there is there, there's a bit of pausing. So you really don't want the music to ramp up every time there's a pause. So the way that you combat that is to slow it down. So in this case, it's not going to start letting the music rise back up unless there's approximately 1.312 seconds of, si of total silence or whatever falls below the sensitivity, which is effectively your threshold, the point at which it detects where dialogue begins and ends, okay? So if you wanna, you know, if we wanted it to fade back up every time there was a pause or a little bit of silence, which is what we did quickly, make it a faster fade duration. And what you'll see is there's just some, this is this is uh, some of that room tone right there. It's just fading up ever so slightly, fading back there because there's a longer delay. Same thing here, you can see, there's a longer piece of silence and the music slowly fades up. But it's only fading up by about eight dB, over about a second and a half. So it's a little more gradual, it adds, it creates a little bit more tension. You can see it does a similar thing over here again. This is where he's like cracking over in a beer. So it's it's doing some neat work. Okay, so now let's listen to it with everything and the EQ in place, and I think this sounds great. Oh, but Dwayne, I, I I don't even have any of the money. Amy just, she split and took it all. She... Well, I talked to Amy. She came to see me. You see, she's what they call professional, and you're what they call can't win for losing. She tell you she took it all? She took the whole damn score? What she did is she paid me what she owed me for her half. And now you're gonna pay me what you uh, owe me. But I, don't, I didn't get any of the money. Why, why do I have to pay you if I don't get any of it? Oh, you got it, Well, You got it. You just lost it. You just lost it. And that ain't my fault. Besides, I gave you the tools. I gave you the phones. I gave you the scripts. I told you what to do, and I told you how to do it. But I don't have the money. But I don't care. <laughs> What'd you pay for that sixer? Pretty cool. All right, so there's your before and after. Again, you can see, I love th this moment, it's really effective. And, and it also just happens to be, there's a change, there is some kind of a slight harmonic change in the music here, and it just happened to work out with that fade, where it fades back down before Webb says whatever he says there, and it's, you know, but I don't have any of the money. It's very focused, right? Like it draws you right back in. Let's just play that one more time. You had to do it. But I don't have the money. <laughs> you know, so it's basically a happy accident. I'd love to say, oh yes, it was completely planned. It, it wasn't, I, it, just, it just sort of worked out that way. But again, it's the fade duration, which was, was intentional, that is creating that, that moment to kind of let things release. And you can see when it's, when it's slower, I think the default is 800, maybe I had dropped it to 600 because eight tenths of a second, and it's, it's, we have to put a default in there, so that's why it's there. Why, why 800 milliseconds? Don't know. Is that documented? Okay, <laughs> sure. It has to feel right. It's gonna depend entirely on the pacing of the dialogue, so you're, you're gonna make changes to that, but you can see that it does a lot of work for you. And again, just to point out, if you wanted to make manual changes, if you wanted to fade things up manually, you still have total control over that. Sensei, our machine learning, did all of this. But if you want to do manual change, so I did manual changes here. But if you want to do manual changes on, on the music or whatnot, right, here's what it did. You can do all of that, okay, yourself.
that's that's kind of the brilliance of this. Now, once you do that, if you want to go back to Sensei again, let's say you go, oh, let me adjust that sensitivity, regenerate keyframes, it will erase what you just did. So you're overriding the machine learning uh, automated process. Okay. All right. One last thing here, just uh, in keeping with, you know, showcasing that you still have control. So as mentioned, we applied some EQ, which uh, I manually adjusted. So I, I think I started with like, I just used whatever the default preset was, but ultimately edited it manually. And we added dynamics, right, which is clarity. So just want to point out that while you're only revealed a single slider here, and in particular with EQ, and I really want to emphasize this, and by the way, this uses the graphic equalizer, which is not my favorite. And, uh, you know, I don't think it's the best sounding. There, there's, a, there's a couple of different decent presets in here. I, maybe they work, try them, all right? But being able to manually adjust them is really most likely what you're going to want to do. Even if you don't know what you're doing, play around with it. You know, it's nine times out of 10, you'll probably be able to dial in something that's a little bit better than what the preset is. The preset has to be sort of general, you know? And it's so dependent on how was it recorded? How was it captured? Was it recorded properly? Well, get, you know, there's so many things that go into it. It's just a little hard to nail it. With the exception of something like, I think there's one in there like telephone voice. Yes, that's gonna universally sound the same because it's doing a huge high pass, low pass, and effectively creating a very band limited sort of a sound. Things like that are fine. But, you know, background voice EQ, what, I, what, what does that mean? What does that, tell me what that means. I don't know what that means. I'm an audio engineer. I don't know what that means. A voice in the background. Okay. <laughs> kind of a circular definition there. If you go into effects controls, because as mentioned, the main difference between applying effects in the track mixer, and you can see that I wound up adding many in here in the end, right? A lot of parametric EQ some reverb. This wasn't for echo so much as ambience, some delay, some flange, again, CL. So on the, uh, the overall dialogue mix here, I applied additional compression. This is using one of my favorite um, uh, third party effects. This is the waves emulation of the uh, LA-2A compressor, Teletronics LA-2A. Um, these are applied to anything that lives in the track. So if I apply a parametric EQ to uh, track four here, or three, whatever it is, everything that's in this track is gonna have that sa those same settings. Essential Sound applies things at the clip level. So because of that, when I have this piece of dialogue right here. Well, I talked to Amy, she came to see me. It's applying the Dynamics Processor, which is a compressor, limiter, expander, gate, and it's also applying the Graphic Equalizer. So if I wanted to adjust those, now again, here's one time where I'll tell you, especially where compression is concerned, and that's why I had that little, I'll pull it up again in a second here. Compression is very difficult to understand. It's very difficult to set properly if you don't understand, okay? Uh, we don't have enough time today to go into all the, I will do some compression in the next, when we're in audition, but yeah, you really have to understand that. It's very easy to mess it up or do nothing. A compressor at the base is an amplifier. So what most people wind up doing if they don't know how to set it properly is they just make things louder and like, oh, cool, it's compressed, I get it. No, pro probably not, all right? Um, this is one time where I'll say, unless you really know what you're doing, this, the machine learning that we have going on here with analyzing, this is so good and it just works great because it's also using our probably most confusing and difficult not created by an audio engineer effect in the program. That's all I can tell you there. But if you want to manually adjust things, you can click on edit and then you can make those adjustments. And uh, let me just play it back so you can kind of see here, I'll even solo. You see, she's what they call professional and you're what they call can't win for losing. All right, now what I want to just point out here, if you take a look at all these various settings, and this is why I say this is, this, I, I've said this many times and I see Patrick is asking me if I'm gonna go into setting all this. I'm not, and here's why not. This sounds good. By the way, this one has lots of presets, many of which I created literally 15, 20 years ago. So many of these are in here um, still, and they're good. Again, you you have to adjust thresholds though. That's what this analyze does. It sets the threshold. The threshold is the point at which compression begins. This is the most difficult thing to understand because that works in tandem with the ratios. 
this thing with these segments, it's just, it's so confusing. It's so non-standard. This is, again, this was built by somebody who was not an audio person. So it's very technical and cool, but it's just, it's just awful to use. It's fun if you just want to start messing things around, but it's very easy to set incorrectly. But here's what I want to get at. When you are adjusting the dynamics slider here, take a look at this section here, all right? This isn't just, again, sort of more or less. It appears that way, natural or focused in the UI. But as you're adjusting things, it is dynamically adjusting the parameters of expre uh, expression, compression, expansion, and or limiting. And then when you analyze, it's then re uh, readjusting the threshold, OK? So it's doing a lot with that one slider. It's not just more or less. It's intelligent. It's awesome. I highly recommend taking advantage of that. And if you want to dip into this, you can. The one thing I will tell you, again, this is a bit unstandard, so this is why I don't get into this. But here's something that you can do. If you're trying to apply compression to a specific frequency range within something, this could be if you had some kind of sound design or maybe um, uh, it could be dialogue, I guess, in some cases, and you want to just compress. You know, you can also use compressors to DS as well. That's effectively what a DSer is. Uh, among also adding uh, sidechain equalization. You can band limit, which means you can compress a specific range. So again, we're getting into audio nerdery here. But if you know that you want to compress, you wouldn't do 20. This is the maximum range here. Let's say we want to compress the mid range, 1 kilohertz to 5 kilohertz. And you could, do, you could use this for effect. So you could basically squeeze down the middle of someone's voice, but leave the bassiness and the, the high over, you know, untouched. You would do this for instruments, really, not voice. But you can do that. Also, and this is where things get confusing, you have in here a level detector and a gain processor. The gain processor and the level detector both have attack and release times. The difference is the level detector has input gain, and the, out the gain processor has output gain. The gain processor attack and release is actually what affects the attack and release of the compression itself. The level detector is how it how it's fed into the compressor. I told you a compressor is an amplifier. So you have two amplification stages here, plus you also have the makeup gain stage, which is at the very end of the signal chain. If I'm losing you, yeah, that no bleep. That's why I'm not talking about this one. This is why I recommend just using the clarity slider. Okay? <laughs> it's a long way around to say that. Secondarily, by the way, and here, if you wanna if you wanna learn more about compression and how to do it properly with a standard compressor, go here. All right, I'm gonna take a sip while that's up. I'll check later at my bit.ly to see how many people have gone there. And it will be in the tens, I'm sure. Okay. Let's go back. All right. Now, additionally. Graphic equalizer. So now in this case, the amount is just that. It's how much of the EQ <laughs> are you applying, right? But as you'll see, anybody who, uh, you know, this is going to be probably an age thing. Although, I, I don't know. I mean, I guess if you've been doing stuff on a, on a PC or Mac for at least a good 10, 15 years, if anybody remembers like Winamp, you know, some of those players, Windows Media Player, you used to have some kind of like a graphic equalizer. Right? If you're old school, you'd have one of these in your stereo system like I did years ago. This allows you to tweak individual frequency bands. So below 31, this is going to be your subsonics. 63 hertz, this is like the fundamental of a kick drum, which also for, for many voices, particularly six foot five uh, hairy dudes like myself, you're going to have a lot of fundamentals down here. 125 hertz, 250. This is also kind of known as the mud range. So if you have dialogue or you have something that just kind of sounds a little, a little muddy, a little muffled, cut at 250. It's going to take some of that muffle out of there. Uh, 500, just again, that's the octave of 250 here. That's a, we tend to get a little bit of boxiness around 500. 1K is right in the middle. So again, 2K, 4K. 8K, this is where we get 4 to 8K. This is where we can kind of control a little bit of that high end clarity. But also, if you do too much, you can add some sibilance. And then 16, greater than 16K, this is going to be your, your high end. So if you want to add some air, if you want to kind of lift everything up, 
you can do that. And you can make these changes, you can apply these changes manually after the fact. So the point in talking about this is that even despite the fact that, you know, Essential Sound gives you a single slider to affect audio clip-based changes, you still have access to the the effects themselves, all right? And then you can even do some of this. Yeah, you could do you could do this theoretically without even going into the effect. You can see here. Although I mean Okay, so it's a 10 band EQ. If you do it here, you have to guess what the bands are. <laughs> really? Is that really, really? That's what? That's all I'm gonna say about that. So you're gonna wanna click this button so you know what you're doing. All right, makes sense. 16K says, Tim, my monitor is only 4K. <laughs> See what you did there. We're boxy, but we're safe. Aha! Love that movie. Love that movie. Who remembers that movie, that Reverb Mike? Reverb Mike is a is a a cornucopia of classic references. All right. All right. <laughs> All right. What's up? Oh hey, Taria from Finland. Great to see you. All right, Tun says, love the new Essential Sounds options. I'm an animator, but when I need to help my colleagues with enhancing audio, like today, those tools really come in handy, especially when I'm in a hurry. Yes. Elsa, bonjour from France. Yes. Emre from Istanbul. Dwayne Johnson from Mother Earth. Dwayne Johnson, is it you? I'm, I'm so honored. I'm honored either way. Uh... <laughs> Tun says, oh, you're referring to this scene. That's some real Breaking Bad stuff. Yeah, it occurred to me as I was playing this back. I'm like, wow, I wonder what they're talking about. I gave you the phones. I gave you the scripts. I told, gave you the tools. I told you how to do it. And <laughs> sort, of, sort of creepy Breaking Bad. Okay, let us now move over to audition and talk about sound design. So again, you could do this both in Premiere and Audition. If you're going to be laying in sound effects, I, I just find that this is a much better workflow. Now, if you're starting, obviously, if you're sort of cutting video together, you're not gonna do the sound design immediately. So it would make sense that from the Premiere timeline, you might wanna send whatever work you've done over to Audition. And you can do that very simply, very easily. So with your sequence selected, you go up to the edit menu here you'll see that we have edit in Adobe Audition and you can send individual clips, which you can also um, invoke via a right click, control click context menu, or you can send the entire sequence over to Audition. And the brilliance of doing it this way in this method, in this workflow, is that it's going to allow you to one, either send the video dynamically without rendering via dynamic link. And this process is much more effective and works way better and more efficiently than it did in the past. But it's also gonna tie the edit to the sound design mix, all right? So this is, a, this is kind of the method that I, well, this is the method that I use, not kind of. <laughs> so when you choose sequence, it pulls up this dialogue here. Okay, so you give it a name, you tell it where you want it to go, you can choose, do I want the entire sequence or just the work area? You know, standard stuff here. Now, this one is important. How do you want to send the video through? Now, look, if, you're, if your master video here is like, you know, 8K and you're not using proxies, we've done proxies already, use proxies, dynamic link could be a little, little heavy on the processing, little, a little uh, not so light. Maybe rethink that, maybe use proxies, all right? Um, again, it's way better than it used to be. It still works wonderfully, but keep in mind, it's not rendering video. It's basically sending a, a, an alias over to Audition, which is connected to Premiere, which is basically, f uh, can't speak today, filtering the video from Premiere, all the video tracks. So however many tracks of video you have down into one and placing it inside a video panel inside of Audition. 99% of the time I do this. Now, again, I'm not working in 8K, but even still, it works pretty darn well. Now, you can also just do a DV preview video. I don't know why it's still DV. That's also a weird choice. I really need to, that's, that's just weird. Um, you could export a video. The only problem there is that then that assumes that you're at picture lock. Now, 
the truth is both of these kind of assume picture lock because here's the thing. While the video itself is, if you choose dynamic link is always live. If you start putting audio in there and then you go back to Premiere and like you cut a whole scene out, it's not going to dynamically shift everything you did in audition. It will change the video as you see it in audition, right? But it's not going to change position. So you're really locked into things here. So you might say, well, well, then why use dynamic link? It doesn't make sense. Well, again, that assumes picture slash edit lock. Okay. Now what you can still do is let's say some, you know, while you're doing your sound design, the editor says, oh, you know, we have a new version of this or whatever. It's got some color correction. It has lumetry applied, it has some LUTs applied. You can do that live and it'll affect what you see in audition live and you're, it's great. No change, right? It's not changing duration. It's not changing the cut of the video, right? So that's the key. Use dynamic link, assuming picture lock. Preview video, same concept here. Now, why use a preview video? Well, it's just going to be a lighter lift, right? Because that's not having to call Premiere to play back video. It's basically just a rendered MP4. And then you can, of course, just have no video, but that doesn't make sense for sound design. All right. Handles, standard stuff here, right? If there are, if you're using bits of audio in the Premiere timeline and you trimmed them left and right, you can determine how much of a handle, the maximum handle that you want here. Now, this is the cool part, um, transfer info to Audition. So because I've done all of this stuff here, right? I've done all of this uh, uh, essential sound plus mixer stuff here, I can choose, notice, clip effects. So that's everything that you do in, in essential sound. You can transfer it. You can render with non-transferable effects so that it'll actually print those effects to the clip itself. I don't recommend that. Um, render all, remove all. Okay, and then similarly with audio track effects, transfer or remove all. All right, so you might say, why would I ever render? For 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 clip effects in particular, you wouldn't because it'll take whatever you did in Essential Sound in Premiere, and the same thing gets applied in Audition. So this is really really cool, really good workflow. They might say, okay, well, what happens if I do that? And then I go into Audition and then I'm like, oh, you know, I want to export this and share it with someone in Pro Tools. What happens then? Well, that's a different story. This is also assuming that you're staying kind of in the Adobe workflow, right? If you're going to Pro Tools, I'd probably remove everything or print to the clip, assuming that, you know, you're the person in charge, you could make that call, right? And then if they come back and say, oh, I hate the compression you use, well, then you got to re-render, right? Okay, so just things to consider. Pan and volume info, et cetera, and then open an audition. All right. So that's how you can kind of share the timelines together. So as with before, um, here I have, this is the finished one. Now I actually did this live on stream about a year and a half ago. We did it over about three weeks. It, you know, again, it's hard to do an entire, this is only 17 seconds, but to do, you can see the number of clips and all the detail that goes into this hard to kind of lay all this in within 57 minutes. So it took us like three sessions and then I had to kind of work in between some of the master classes. But let me play it for you first and then we'll break down how this is done and sort of good practices for beginning doing sound design and concepts of sound design in Audition. So this is all Adobe stock footage here and uh, let's just go ahead and play it back. So all of that for 17 seconds. Okay. I see Eugene is asking, when I send sequence to Audition, do I just save and all is back in Premiere or do I have to export it back to Premiere? Great question before we get into the sound design part. So what you do when you want to send it back, yes, you are in fact re-rendering re because as I told you, it's not dynamically linked live audio, it's dynamically linked live video. So if you're cutting audio or uh, mixing audio against a picture or designing audio against picture, you need to send all that audio back to Premiere. So the process for doing that on the audition side is up in the multi-track menu. 
you can see that we have an export to Premiere Pro function. So when you select that, this is where you can now choose how you want to send it back into Premiere. So you can send each track as a stem. So again, what that means is all the clips that exist here will be rendered as one. So it would be, you know, ab bright slaps and they'd all be on one track, all timed appropriately. It doesn't change timing, but it takes all those little clips and renders out a single file. All right. That's what your stems are going to do. You can also e export buses as stems or you can do a mix and send the mix back to Premiere. Mono, stereo, or if you're mixing in 5.1, 5.1. So these would be self-contained, you know, one wave file, a mono wave, a stereo wave, or a 5.1 interleaved wave, which then opens back in Premiere and it'll say, what track do you want to put this on? You can say, all right, well, the last track, right? Track 16, whatever it is, and place it there. Now you might ask, why would I do a mix down versus stems? Okay, two reasons. One, again, if you're sort of the final, the final vision of this, using a stereo mix or whatever, that way the director or whomever, if they're watching it and they go, oh, can you retweak this one thing? That mix, remember, because we've sent back and forth dynamically, it has metadata that ties it to that Premiere Pro project. So from within the Premiere Pro timeline, all right, assuming you have access to the, the, the Premiere project, which you could via Dropbox or Frame or any number of ways to tie the media to get right, if you're using shared media, there's metadata that says, oh, this mix is part of this session, which came from this Premiere timeline. Right click, edit in audition. So we just saw edit in audition sequence. This time you just edit it as a clip and it says, oh, do you want to open this as a clip or do you want to open this as a session? And then when you do that, it would reveal all of the original um, pieces of audio, not stems, all the original clips, all right? So you have options there. Now, the reason you would do stems, maybe you don't do any of the mixing here, i.e. you're not using effects, you're just placing all the sounds. That's, that's good because then it's in the director's hands or whomever, then they can send all those stems out to someone, maybe they're gonna mix it in Pro Tools or Logic or wherever else. Then all the timings are correct, everything is clean and dry, nothing's been processed, and then they have full control, okay? So you have, you have options there. All right, so to get into this, let's move back. Stuart, I really wish Adobe would figure out how to integrate this workflow so it's possible to work back and forth between apps seamlessly. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty good the way it is. I get what you're saying. I, I, you basically want the audio to be dynamically linked live too. Yeah, I mean, um, look, I, I, I complain about a lot of things. That's no small task, right? <laughs> so ultimately, this is why if you, if you need that, just do it all in Premiere, really, or do it all here. Well, I, of course, you can't edit video here, but you know, I mean, you could theoretically do it in After Effects too. That, that part of the equation just hasn't been worked out yet. But as far as going back and forth, it, it's pretty good. It works, it works pretty well, minus not having a, the ability to have live audio. Okay, so before you do anything, obviously, now we have lots of sounds that are involved here. You know, sound design is, is an art form like, like many things in, in the creative arts. Uh, I did sound design for a brief period when I was still in, in, in the biz full time. And it's fun, it's also very time consuming. And a lot of that time is just spotting where stuff needs to go. So the first thing that I'll do, now again, I'm breaking down from a, a pre-existed um, timeline here, just so you can kind of get the concept because it would take too long otherwise, is literally just figuring out where does sound need to go. So the first thing you can do is make sure, and you can, you can use um, some, you, you know, you can reorganize windows and do this however you want. You're going to basically go through your timeline. And by the way, if you right click on the video in Audition, I just want to show point out some of the options here. So um, you can scale it if need be, right? You can adjust resolution. So these are the same fractional playback settings. If you're dynamically linking video from Premiere, this is very essential because again, maybe you're on an older system. Maybe you're just, you're not on a super powerful system. Maybe you're not working with proxies. Maybe your system can't handle full resolution playback. So just like with Premiere, you can say, all right, play it back at half res or quarter res. That's enough for me to, to spot. And then you'll see you have the option full resolution on stop. So, you know, a lot of times, especially as you're working in frames, 
it, it, it can be very, very challenging to kind of line things up. I'll talk about that in a second. So it's important that you see the full frame resolution because if you have like a, a pixelated blurry punch in this case, you might not see when it's all, you know, at one eighth res, if you're in 1080p, that it's not quite hitting the face yet, in which case you're gonna have to retime things anyway. So that's that. Spot video frame when adjusting audio clip. We're gonna talk about that. Time code overlay, you can see it's present here. And then there's some other video preferences. Again, you can just go into those. It's, it's nothing, it's more about how the time code is displayed on screen and all that stuff and what time code you're seeing, whether it's system time code or clip time code. In this case, coming from uh, Premiere. Okay, so again, first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna kind of scrub through, right? And we're going to find where is that first hit? Now, you may notice up at the top here that I am in my time code reference in my audition timeline is in hours, minutes, seconds. And it stands for HMS. That is the standard. Now, if we go back to Premiere, just for a second here, and I, I, I don't think I've talked about this. I wanna, I wanna get into this a little bit because this is, this is essential, all right? By default, now I think you can change this in the default setting, sequence settings to feet and frames, but by default, we're always working in frames, right? If we snap in, sorry, if we zoom in all the way, as I move that cursor, I am moving in frames, right? Now, when we're talking audio, right? We, we don't work in frames in audio. I mean, we can, I'll show you that, but if you're making music, you're doing other things in an audio editor, you never work in frames. You're always working in some kind of absolute time code, okay? In Premiere, there are some cases where you may need to slip or slide audio outside of the frame boundary. Now, this can be very dangerous, so I'm gonna show you this, but you have to keep in mind that um, you gotta be mindful of what you're doing. So by default, we're always working in frames. But if we wanna work in the subframe level, in Premiere Pro, this is referred to as audio time units, okay? Which is, I don't say essentially, which is or means you're working at sample level, all right? So if you go into audio time units, you're gonna notice that this number here, so this is hours, minutes, seconds, samples, all right? We're now working in samples. Now, this project is in 48K. The sample rate of the project is 48,000 samples per second, all right? So what that means is at a granular level, you'll notice I can keep zooming in here and we're getting down to sample level, okay? Now, if you move something 10 samples, are you going to hear the change? No, there's 48,000 per second. So anything less than 4,800 samples, a tenth of a second, you know, or somewhere in there, it could be 24, you get what I'm saying. Super small increments are not going to be audibly noticeable. So audio units, you don't, you don't necessarily always want to zoom down to what it, it, it lets you get to like, I don't think it lets you get to individual samples here. We zoom down all the way. Oh, it looks like it does, yeah. This is, this is almost too much because invariably you're going to be moving things too little or too aggressively. But that's how you shift things beyond the boundary of the frame. And a lot of times with sound effects, you need to do that. Now, here's the thing. If you're going to make that change, make sure after you slip or slide or move a piece of audio, you go back to frames. Because if you start moving video around, it's, it's stuff will fall. You're, everything's going to fall apart. It'll be a mess. So I, I, I caution going into audio time units, but this is something that, you know, you're not gonna run into a lot, but occasionally if you're doing sound design in Premiere, you need to shift something. You need to be able to move beyond the frame boundary. That's how you do it, okay? All right. Now, over in the audition side, if we right click, control click in the ruler or timeline here, you can see you have the time display. Now, I can go into, I'm in uh, 23976, over there. I can do that. I can absolutely do that. And I'm, I think, let's see, I zoom down here. It looks like, yeah, you could even see, I did the sound design for a lot of the, they're not at frame boundaries. They're at subframe because just the way that this worked out, 
Some of the sound effects may have kind of fallen within the frame boundary, many not, right? This one looks like it did, this one looks like it didn't, et cetera, et cetera. So that's why I'll have sort of the time code, the frame time code on the clip here, but I generally will sort of move in hours, minutes, seconds if I'm doing sound design, because most likely you're going to need to slip and slide things. And Audition here doesn't care. Now, here's the difference. Hours, minutes, seconds, or decimal, all right, is different than sample level. This is not at the sample level, because again, those increments are too small. If I were redesigning Premiere today, it wouldn't be sample, it would just be hours, minutes, seconds because you don't need to move things at the sample level, but you might need to move something 100 milliseconds, right? <laughs> or 50 milliseconds or whatever. So again, getting a little nerdy here, but understanding those concepts matters because if you need to move things at the subframe level, you need to kind of know what you're doing. All right, so that's how we, again, sort of reference picture time code here, but I'm gonna keep the standard HMS here in the timeline. And then once I kind of figure out, all right, here I need a punch, all right? I drop in a marker, shortcut key M in Audition. And you'll see here that it tells me exactly where it is. Now, one of the other things, unfortunately, that we don't have in Audition, we don't have color-coded markers. So what I will do instead is for different types of punches or different sounds, like if I have, I try and unify punches on the same track. I try to, you know, here you can see there's a lot of, those are whooshes. I try and use whooshes with similar color codes, etc. So this is where I kind of use track color coding to handle what I can't do via um, the markers themselves. If you right click at the edge of the track here, you can adjust the track color and this will bring up your color picker. So these are all predefined, but you can also, you know, if you wanted to manually adjust this, you can also manually adjust the hues like this. So this is not unlike having the color wheel uh, in Premiere, Photoshop, etc., cetera, whatnot. Um, there are presets. Actually, you can see there's even more presets. You know, Premiere has 16 now. You can still modify them here. It's all sort of modifiable and they just, they just give you more by default, okay? So we kind of spot where everything needs to go and I drop in a marker, right? Keep moving here, right? Another punch, right? And this is why I say, remember, we're working in frames. You can see the time code. So you can see the video. It's not like we're not in slow-mo. You're not going to get all those moments in between the frames. But it's the sound may come a little before or after. And by the way, just because you drop the marker there, when it's actually playing in real time, you still may need to shift or slip or slide a little bit. All right? Okay, so here. I'm saying I need a big... I, I missed, I don't know if you can see my little, my comment here is, you know, miss whoosh, right? So that's the first thing is you're gonna go through, this is whoosh punch. And see, it's the hand that's out of sight, all right? Punch plus whoosh, but also, all right? Go through and you spot all of those. Now, again, as mentioned, you have this spot video frame when adjusting audio clip. So just to kind of show you here, if we go back, let's go to the first one. Let's go to this first one. Now, I'm gonna go into my, uh, let me bring my files down here. The first thing, of course, you're gonna to wanna to do is acquire lots of different sounds. And for something like boxing, in fact, this was, a, this was a user suggestion, which is why I did boxing in the first place. I can't remember how this came about. This is, it requires so many sounds. Now you might think, well, but punches, you know, what's the difference? You might say, well, what do you need? Two, 10, 20? Yes, as many as possible. Because the thing is, usually one punch, one sound isn't even enough, all right? You, you actually need multiple sounds to create something that's dramatic. And it depends where you hit, right? So it has to vary. If you don't have enough variation, it's just not gonna sound real. And if you don't have enough variation, sometimes among having a lot of sounds, you have to stack sounds to again, make them bigger, make them more pronounced, change them, pitch shift them, do different things to them. So there's lots of different techniques that you can implement. So just to kind of showcase here, 
in the files panel. So I created all of these ab punches by, you guessed it, punching my own abs. <laughs> and if you want to audition these, hear what they sound like, you can turn on the autoplay command here. And as I hover over them, These are all done in a bathroom, by the way, so they have some natural ambience to them, all right? Now I also have like different Foley things in here. You might think, well, why would I use hand grabbing a wooden gate or a hollow wood surface? Well, for the same reason that, <laughs> you know, we're so used to, and Rocky is really, for me, it's still the best because it takes a lot of sound to really translate. You know, if you just hear punching, it's not, it's not that great. You might, you might hear the B slap, like on someone's face. Woo, that, that'll, that'll you know, put chills down your spine. But punches, it's not like the movies, right? Or, or in real life, in other words, you know, just, just hitting things, it's not like that. So you have to really stack things to make them more dramatic. Uh, here's like, again, some more. Here's, I actually used a kick drum. Then I was hitting a pillow. That is, by the way, if you're curious, that's a tempur pillow. So it's very thick, very dense, mic'd with uh, Sennheiser MD, uh, was that the four, 420? I can't remember. 421. It's a reverse punch. That one I acquired from somewhere. Now again, those whooshes are way too long and way too reverberant, but you can see how, again, using a little time shift or pitch shifting, you know, especially when it goes to slow-mo, maybe we use some of that. Maybe by speeding some of those up, it's just gonna add a little drama. So if we go back to this first punch here, Let's do a bright punch and let's drop that into the timeline. All right. Now, as mentioned, you got to find where is the attack here. So I have it. I'm going to go right against the marker. I'm going to turn off snapping. All right. Because again, you might need to slip things. So I turned off snapping. All right. <laughs> it's so fast, right? All right. And let's do, let's do two while we're at it. So we've got a punch here. We'll shrink this up. I'm gonna put this one here under bright slaps. All right, again, so fast. Let's just play this back here. I mean, it works now, right? Hopefully it's coming through, but it's so small, right? I mean, it has no, there's no effect whatsoever. So you got to start stacking things. So now on the top hit, we have this. Let's try adding a slap to that. All right. So maybe I'll put this one here. And it's okay if I crossfade these a little. I'm not worried about that. All right. Now we're getting somewhere. All right, that one needs more of a thump. Maybe a deep punch down here. All right. Again, zoom in a bit so I can see where I'm doing this. You get the idea? Now remember, these are still dry. We haven't added ambience. That, all that comes into play. And just for reference, let's go back to the original here. Now I'm gonna turn off all of the additional, you know, I have like bought the crowd and other, you know, ambience, ouch. Oh, I just kicked my foot on my, ah, subwoofer, ow. 
Did you hear that? That was the sound of a cracking toe. Oh, mmm. Oh my god, it hurt. Oh. <gasps> what, did I just crash audition? <laughs> I did. I don't know how I just did that, but, oh, look at that, we're out of time. Ah, oh, too bad. Well, friends, sometimes these things happen. We are actually out of time. We're going to continue this in three weeks. So we have no stream next week. We are off next week. Global day off for Adobe employees. We'll be back the week after that on the 24th. We're going to be talking about um, exporting. But then we're going to come back to this. Again, if you want to find out more about this, you can go back to the streams uh, from a year ago on my channel as well, where we kind of created this whole sound design thing, talk more about this. This was a kind of cool sort of initial overview to getting all this started. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great rest of your morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in the world, and we'll see you again next time. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.